वेलकम टू ई पी जी पाठशाला आई एम प्रोफेसर बी हरिहरन फ्रॉम द इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ इंग्लिश यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ केरला द पेपर दैट वी आर डिस्कसिंग इज ट्वेंटी सेंचुरी इंग्लिश लिटरेचर एंड द मोड्यूल इज ऑन जॉन फॉल्स फ्रेंच लेफ्टिनेंट वुमन John Fowles was born in Leon C Essex a suburb of London on March 31st 1926 He started his writing career in 1963 with the publication of The Collector These are some of his major works there's some 20 odd major works that he has starting from 1963 The Collector to the two volume journals published in 2003 and 2006 in the intervening period he published works like the magus which was revised in 1977 and the text that we are looking at the french lieutenant woman in 1969 the shipwreck in 1975 daniel martin in 1977 the enigma of stonehenge 1980 and in 1990 lime regis camera and then followed by one collection of essays and occasional writings titled wormholes now the french lieutenant woman was published in 1969 and it won both critical and popular acclaim and this has been translated into more than 10 languages it was adapted into a classic film in 1981 and the screenplay of that film was incidentally penned by none other than Harold Pinter it was also adapted into a play a british play in 2006 it is difficult i should say to summarize the plot line or the story of this novel however i would say that this book is about the relationship between two individuals an amateur naturalist charles smithson and the former governor Sarah Woodruff now this book throws light on Fowles's familiarity with Victorian literature and this has been chosen as one of the 100 best english language novels now i would like to uh, very briefly indicate something about some of the debates that have um, come up discussions that have come up with the publication of the of the novel This is a book that has generated a whole lot of commentary um critical uh, attention critics have not readers have not agreed on everything that has been said This novel is set in the Victorian age but then there are people there are readers who argue that uh Victorian England is treated in a very superficial manner uh some argue that this is a feminist novel but then there are some others who say that it's it falls short of those expectations brian mckayl in postmodern fiction in this book postmodern fiction certainly does refer to this book uh as a classic example of the postmodern novel but again here opinion is divided there are some who uh say that it's postmodern is essentially postmodernist in tendencies but then there are others that who argue that this is a very traditional novel now this is interesting in the guise of a postmodern one now this is the other argument that we get to hear and therefore uh this is a novel that requires a very serious attention for uh the kind of narrative spin that um john fowles is able to bring in and make for a very engaging kind of uh, a reading i refer to the film that was made now the film starred meryl streep and jeremy irons there was also a lot of discussion by those who had read the novel regarding the film and related questions on theories of adaptation and the kind of things that happen when you adapt a novel into a film there is a very interesting remark that john fowles made in 1969 about the composition of this novel 
and he talked about the composition of the novel in an article titled Notes on an Unfinished Novel. Now, in that particular essay or note, this is what he wrote. I'll read out what he wrote. You are not trying to write something one of the Victorian novelists forgot to write, but perhaps something one of them failed to write. Now, this is something really interesting. And remember the etymology of the word. A novel is something new. It must have relevance to the writers now. So don't ever pretend you live in 1867 or make sure the reader knows it's a pretense. Now this is what Fowles wrote. Now there's more that he had to say. Uh, he said that there was this image uh, that uh, haunted him uh, during the autumn of 1966. And what was that image? That image was of a woman who stands at the end of a deserted key and stares out at sea. Now this, one can say, was the seed of the novel. And he also very much believed that this woman that he saw, this image, was of a woman who lived during the Victorian age. And she somehow seemed to have had a mysterious, vaguely romantic qualities. Now, um, this is a novel that is indebted, Fowl says, to many other authors. Now, there's one particular uh, text that has been identified by Aileen Warburton. And uh, this is a text that came out in 1823. It's a novel titled Aurika, O-U-R-I-K-A, by Claire de Dura. Now, this novel is about a tragic affair between an African woman and a French military personnel. These are the characters that we have in the French left hand woman. We'll introduce some of them. The main character, of course, is Sarah Woodruff. She is the French left hand woman. She's also known as tragedy. And the French lieutenant's whore. Charles Smithson is a baron, an orphan who is dependent on his uncle. He is an amateur paleontologist. He is a man of science. Now, Ernestina Freeman. Ernestina Freeman is Charles's fiancé and is the daughter of a wealthy tradesman. Sam is Charles's servant and Mary is the maid of Ernestina's aunt, Mrs. Tranter. Sir Robert is Charles's uncle and Mrs. Tompkins is a widow whom Sir Robert marries. Now she has a child after this marriage, but the father of the child is not Sir Robert. So this gives you an idea of some of the um, major characters in this novel. Now it's set in the mid 19th century. It opens in the coastal town of Lyme Regis, a town where Fowles lived. It's set in 1867. We did say that Sarah Woodruff is the protagonist and uh, she is identified as the protagonist rather by the self-conscious narrative voice in this novel. She is leading a life in the novel as it opens as a disgraced woman, as a pariah. She is believed to be jilted by a French sailor and is supposed to be waiting for his return. She is now working as a servant in the Marlborough house of Mrs. Pultney. Sarah spends her limited free time staring out at the sea on the cob, a stone jetty, and walking on where commons a large wood. You have, uh, this is a, a telltale image that you have captured in the film as well. I'm sure we will be able to see the photographs the cob. I would urge you to take a look at the photograph, the pictures that we have of this place where she used to be frequenting. The cob at Lyme Regis, the opening scene of the novel. 
where Charles and Ernestina encounter Sarah for the first time. And then you have another image of Sarah frequently the cop. This is from the film, The French Lieutenant's Woman. The opening scene of the book is something that's very popular, popularly available in the film. Now, Charles sees her for the first time and then he is rather curious about her. And this curiosity ripens into a passionate relationship. Now, that is how the story develops. He is probably going to get married to Ernestina. It's at this time that he gets into this passionate relationship with Sarah. And soon after, he starts meeting her frequently, very often. And all these meetings are in a very clandestine manner. They get to talking and Sarah reveals to him a lot about her history and then requests that she requires his help and support. Now, in the meanwhile, Sam, we have seen Sam earlier, Sam falls in love with Mary. Sir Robert gets engaged to Mrs. Tompkins, resulting in Charles' loss of inheritance. Now, much of this has to do with the setting of the novel, which is very, very Victorian. And from what I've said, I think it's, it must be fairly clear that there are uh, a number of affairs, uh, marriage uh, propositions, marriages, um, that take place, uh, inheritance, plans, the kind of benefits that, that would accrue if one were to marry, the kind of considerations that are there if or when one decides to marry a girl. Now, these are some of the things that are worked in uh, in a very interesting way in this book. There is also, uh, what you have here is a kind of um, love triangle, so to speak, where you have Charles, Ernestina and Sarah. So this, this is a kind of a love triangle here. Uh, and it's for this reason that we would say that Ernestina is very much upset that um, Sir Robert got married to uh, Mrs. Tompkins and Charles seems to have lost his inheritance and then there are these love affairs that uh, blossom and therefore things uh, you know, start happening and uh, it's the right kind of recipe uh, for uh, in, in a narrative to, to catch the attention of the reader. Charles as we said, to look at the story, it's very difficult to really summarize this novel and, and the story here. Charles is deeply in love with Sarah. He advises her to leave Lyme for Exeter, where he thinks that she will have more freedom. Charles is fascinated with Sarah because he thinks that she is free. And he thinks that a relationship with her would also make him free. Soon after this advice, etc., Sarah is dismissed by Mrs. Poultney and she leaves. Charles is a very worried person. He is very much concerned now about her. He discovers now a note left to him by Sarah. Now, these are the staples that we have of the typical 19th century English novel. And what Fowles is doing is working with that very tradition of the Victorian novel. This is a note that Charles finds and Sam also sees this and Sam starts getting ideas and he figures out what's exactly happening between his master Charles and Sarah and even has thoughts of blackmailing Charles to extract money so that he could live his life with Mary. For Sir Robert, Charles's uncle, life is not going well in Vinci at his house because, very simple, Mrs. Tompkins, his wife, as I said earlier, becomes pregnant by the butler. Sir Robert, Charles' uncle, confesses that it was a mistake to marry her and assures Charles that he will not go unprovided for, which means Charles would still get his inheritance. When you try to summarize what happens in the novel like this, much of what the novel does is missed out. And this, I would say, is one of the um, reasons why uh, it would be difficult to categorize this as either a postmodern novel or it's not a postmodern novel or it's a realistic novel. Uh, and it gets even more uh, complicated 
uh, when we look at what uh, the novelist does to uh, tie all the ends together. Now, Sarah has left, there's a note, Charles cannot forget her. True love, how can one forget? He realizes and he admits that he is marrying Ernestina, not because he loves her, but for her money, for her wealth. And he sets out to warn Ernestina's father about the inheritance which is uncertain because he thinks that the appropriate thing at this point would be to end his relationship with Ernestina. This is what he intends or he intended. On his return, he stops in Exeter. He had sent Sarah to Exeter. He told her that that is the place for her. He stops in Exeter to visit Sarah. Now, here, what apparently was seemed to have been a very straight narrative becomes a little tricky. Because what you have here is, at this point, there is this journey, remember. On this journey, the self-conscious narrator who intervenes throughout the novel later becomes a character in it and offers you three different conclusions. So you have a novel here which has three conclusions. You even have the self-conscious narrator traveling with Charles on the train. We have, uh, as readers of uh, novels, we would have started off a novel, would have uh, listened to what the characters say, would have seen how they progress, what happens, who goes where, who meets whom, what was solved, what was addressed, etc. And then we would come to the last page of the novel and the novel ends. But then here you have a novel which offers you three different conclusions for you, the reader, to choose. When it came out, for the first readers of the novel, this can be quite interesting. It can even also be amusing or even challenging, depending on how you would like to read it, how you would like to see it. So we have a novel. Now, I think this is probably a very fascinating part here, a novel with multiple endings. Now, let's look at these endings. This multiple endings in this novel has received critical attention. I would like to say that this is something that we cannot reduce to some kind of a jugglery or some kind of a narrative trick. No, it's not that. I think it will be more appropriate to say that this narrative has three fake endings. You are not talking about one ending. We are saying that this novel has three fake endings. They are all endings nevertheless. Now, what are these endings about? All these are endings which have Charles searching for Sarah. So what we will do now is, we, we are kind of familiar with the love triangle part. These are things that we have all read. We all have, we all know a lot about these things. We would have read a number of stories about this. Now, let's look at this ending part. The first ending. In the first ending, Charles doesn't visit Sarah. He reaffirms his love for Ernestina, marries her. And they have children. But then, they do not have a happy married life. The story at this point draws attention to Charles's indifference to Sarah, to what happens to her. Now, there comes a twist. At this point, we don't do anything. The narrator rejects this ending as a daydream by Charles. So, what we thought was an ending, the narrator tells you was only a daydream, was a dream that Charles had. Right? So, this is one reason why we say it's a fake ending. Look at this. The narrator here appears as a character sharing a railway compartment with Charles before you have the second ending and the third ending. Now, uh, look, at, look at this. You have uh, a very, very self-conscious narrator. I think by this time we become very alert as to what, what the novelist is doing. And I think we become very alert as to the form of the novel. You start asking questions about the assumptions that we have about the form of the novel. The kind of taken for grantedness that we have as readers when we read a book. Now, uh, there are, uh, John Fowles has talked about why he gave multiple endings, we will come to that. But now, for the moment, uh, let's assume that we, are, we have also boarded the train along with this narrator. 
before the second and third ending, now that we know that the first ending was only a dream. What about the second ending? In the second ending, Charles and Sarah enter into a physical relationship, a sexual relationship. And at this point, he comes to know that she is a virgin. Now, this is very interesting because earlier on in the narrative, she had told him a lot about her French lieutenant. And this is something that uh, startles Charles. And this is perhaps what fatally attracts him to her. Because there is this image that she has constructed. And here in the second ending, you are told that she was a virgin. Charles, at this point, breaks his engagement with Ernestina. And then proposes to Sarah. How? He writes a letter, gives that letter, entrusts it to Sam, who purposefully does not deliver it. Now, this must be, for a, a very alert reader of a novel, this must be something that's very familiar. A letter is written, it doesn't reach the destination. This is something that you would see in a novel like Tess of the Durbarville by Thomas Hardy. Now, the letter doesn't, uh, Sam doesn't give this letter to Sarah. Now, Ernestina's father disgraces Charles before the engagement is broken off. Now, Charles is disgraced. What does he do? He goes abroad to Europe and then from there to the United States, to America. Meanwhile, Sarah doesn't know any of this. From Exeter, she flees to London. And she leaves no forwarding address, so nobody knows where she is now. Charles is in, was in Europe and from there he has gone to the United States. Charles's men search for her while he is abroad. Charles has to wait for two years to get information that Sarah has been found. There's a lot of time there. What does he do? He rushes back, hurries back to England. Where is Sarah? Sarah has been living now in the house of the decadent painter poet Dante Gabriel Rossetti, D.G. Rossetti. This poet who wrote that poem, The Blessed Damosel, Dante Gabriel Rossetti. So she is there. So now the plot becomes very interesting. It becomes a truly Victorian novel in the sense that you have Victorian artists, poets finding place here. Now, Sarah shows Charles their child, leaving him in hope that all three of them may be united someday. Now, this is the second ending and it's perhaps very romantic because you have uh, a union and there is a separation and after a long time people go missing and they come together. And then there is hope that maybe all of them will lead a happy life. Is that possible? There is a third ending. In the third ending, the narrator reappears outside the residence of Mr. Dante Gabriel Rossetti. So other things are the same. Now this is very interesting. You have the train journey and the first ending, you have the train journey, you are given one ending and you are told that it was a daydream, fake. The second ending, there's a train journey, comes forward and then she is not to be found, a lot of uh, disgrace, etc. And then he leaves, two years, she is found, he comes back, he comes here, and then there is hope. Look at the third ending now. It says, the narrator reappears outside the residence of Mr. Dante. Not Charles, the narrator appears outside the residence of Mr. Dante and turns back his pocket watch by 15 minutes. That's interesting. Events are the same as in the second ending version. Everything is the same. The crucial thing here is the meeting between Charles and Sarah. 
the second ending had charles sir and sarah coming with the baby and saying look maybe we could all live together happily get married you have in the third ending the narrator coming in and then taking the pocket watch and setting the time 15 minutes back the hands back and then charles meets sarah the reunion is not happy it is bitter it is sad in the third ending the parentage of the child is not made clear sarah is a changed person she has no interest in reviving this relationship with charles charles leaves the house rejecting sarah it's not romantic after all this all these love affairs and love triangles and after uh, after after let's say arousing all our expectations etc you have a third ending and this version is not conventional by any standard yet one can say that it's very realistic perhaps an ending appropriate for a 20th century novel or a 20th century postmodern novel postmodern because the author refuses to limit the freedom of his characters refuses to deny his readers the exercise of their imagination so the readers ex- imagination is not curtailed the narrator in the novel doesn't tell you this is what you need to take you are free to take any of these endings they could all be fake endings we need to have as umberto eco once very famously put it faith in fakes so fake endings is quite possible fake endings there is no one ending right and yet there are all these possible stories by the time we come to the last few pages of the novel you the reader is confronted with all these stories though we had started off with only one story with multiple endings there are possibilities of telling the story in maybe three or more than three different ways now let's very quickly look at the structure and style of the novel now this is seen as an example of postmodern fiction i have briefly indicated something of the debate that has gone on about the status of about the genre of this novel we have seen what the novel does regarding the ending and this can be seen as some kind of a, a technique that is used a postmodern technique if one might want to call it by that name what are the narrative strategies the narrative strategies used have been labeled as postmodern we can identify at least four of them one is of course parody the second one is intertextuality i'm sure the students who listen to this are aware of what intertextuality is historiography and metafiction is a third strategy that is used and of course what we have seen now multiple endings now maybe we could very quickly take one of these things one by one the first uh, part that we mentioned was parody now i would very quickly read out something here on how parody works in this novel what falls does is to recreate and parody the victorian tradition a little bit but then he does much more than parodying the victorian tradition what he is doing is he is working with victorian fiction with the conventions of victorian fiction consciously using those conventions to serve his own purpose and in the process telling the reader exactly what he is doing there are very clear indicators in this book about this each chapter has at least one paragraph taken from some literary text from victorian literature at least one paragraph from one text that came out during victorian times it could be fiction it could be non fiction now the epigraph that you have there sets the tone for each chapter that sets the tone for each chapter so what he also does is to combine very skillfully 19th century victorian prose style or superimpose a 19th century victorian prose style with a 20th century modernist perspective so you have two entirely different things coming together now try to look at the effect that it will have on the reader fine so this is the parody part now there are more things here John Falls is the omniscient voice that you have number 1 what falls does is that as he writes he analyzes the form in which he writes that's one thing the form in which he writes he analyzes and he himself is writing the form so there are two things that he is doing he also becomes a character in the novel now can you think of a victorian novel where the author 
who is writing the novel has become a character. So here, Fowles himself becomes a character in the novel. We have seen that he enters the first class railway compartment and looks like God, an omnipotent God. This also, in a way, is a parody, uh, one might say, of um, the omniscient, um, all-knowing narrator that um, Victorian writers uh, have used. What comes to mind is the, the, the last line in Test of the Durbarville, where you have the omniscient, the all-knowing narrator saying, uh, after um, the execution of Tess, the president of the immortals has ended his port with Tess. What you have here is a, a complete revision of that in terms of the narrative voice and what the voice is trying to do here. So this is a very interesting thing that you have here in this text. You have very many instances of authorial intrusion in the narrative. Now, what Fowles is doing here is to tell the reader that, look here, I am the author, I am the narrator, and I am manipulating things. It's like the, the narrator, the, the, play, the, the one who uh, deals with the cards, showing you his hand and saying, look, I am pulling the shots or I am pulling the strings and I am manipulating. And whatever you have seen so far is an act of manipulation. So the, this is a novel that tries to tell you how, the, how writers manipulate reality through art. There are discussions here about scientific theories of Charles Darwin, the political philosophy of Karl Marx, the work of Matthew Arnold, Chenny Sun, Arthur Hugh Clough, Jane Austen, many more. I would uh, urge you to look at uh, the, the clips that we have, the poem by Arthur Hugh Clough, which is also here as part of uh, this class, uh, a 12-line poem, uh, which is a very interesting example of the next part that we have to look at intertextuality. But before that, let's take a quick look at uh, a couple of other things in this section. Um, what we have been talking about so far, the parodic part, has to do with meta-historical and meta-fictional voices. What it does is it gives a lot of scope here opening for this narrator to question, interrogate the role of historians, the role of authors in the way in which they claim to reclaim the past. It also undermines the narrative authority of the narrator also in the sense that one can perhaps question these things. Now coming to the second part, to the intertextuality part, what happens here is that the text that we have acknowledges a previous literary work. Now, this is something that critics have recognized to be a feature of postmodernism. So you have an intruding author and a particular interpretation of the text. The book has intertextual references. There are a number of them. And these references seem to be providing additional commentary. We had talked about the epigraphs. Let us look at some of them. Now, when you have these epigraphs from these Victorian narratives superimposed onto a 20th century novel, there is an effect. This is an effect that Linda Hutchian, for example, would refer to as ironic play. There's a lot of irony that is generated. So now you can see how what apparently was a straight or even a love triangle, a straight love story or even a love triangle, a story which had uh, two women and one man. Now that becomes uh, a lot more fascinating for the kind of layers that are there in it, for the kind of layers that we can discover in it. And this is what, this is this, it is this richness of reading that I must say uh, really makes this text very dear in the, in the 20th and even the 21st century. Now, there are, uh, if, you, if you know your Victorian literature fairly well, you will be able to identify the works and ideas of quite a lot of them. I will mention a few of them. William Thackeray, Jane Austen, George Eliot, Charles Dickens, Thomas Hardy, Karl Marx, 
they are all direct inspirations inspirations for this kind of a parody there is even a debate in this novel between charles and mr freeman about darwin's origin of species now what uh, fouls is doing here is exactly what um earlier practitioners of the novel who contributed to its growth and development had conceived uh, of uh, what this particular form could do one need to probably just go back a few years in time maybe a few a few decades in time or maybe on 100 years to um a book like um tustram shandi or um the american uh, novel by herman melville moby dick to see what we are trying to say you have this uh, discussion of a scientific treatises playing some kind of a, a narrative role in the novel now uh debates about religion debates about science marx being quoted now we have talked about intertextuality the other thing that i would like to mention here is the use of historiography and metafiction linda hachian has claimed that this is a novel that belongs to the historiographic metafiction genre this is for her a postmodern genre this is a combination of narratives with history and literature coming together combining in various ways in which knowledge is produced within a culture now this is how linda hachin would try to present it or understand this what has been noted in particular is the self reflexive nature of narration here and this for her bridges different discourses that usually remain separated such as academic history literary criticism philosophy and literature now this is uh, how uh, this has been discussed now let's um, there are many instances of this in the novel now uh, there are questions of gender also here um, it's is probably a good love story but then there is much more to it than we have seen that than a love story it has multiple endings this is again something that we have seen now i would like to quote fouls himself on why he decided to have more than one ending he wrote in an article titled hardy and the hag now he made a remark about the ending of the novel i would like to read out this for you he said i wrote and printed two endings to the french lieutenant's woman entirely because from early in the first draft i was torn intolerably between wishing to reward the male protagonist my surrogate with the woman he loved and wishing to deprive him of her that is i wanted to pander to both the adult and the child in myself i had experienced a very similar predicament in my two previous novels the earlier ones yet i am now very clear that i am happier where i gave two with the unhappy ending and not in any way for objective critical reasons but simply because it had seemed more fertile and onward to my whole being as a writer now this is what fouls had to say we can learn a lot from it there are at least four themes apart from all this that we can identify here existentialism is one theme feminism is another sexual repression and gender is a third and the great victorian dilemma i think we have covered more or less some of these things in the course of this discussion let us try to conclude make some concluding remarks here this is an experimental novel this is a historical novel focusing on england in the 1860s that is the first thing to keep in mind it's an experimental work it assumes the form of a victorian love triangle novel he joins the avant garde along with writers like alain rob grill and john barth as a historical novel this is this this work presents us with allusions even footnotes to everything from evangelism to evolution from imperialism to marxism there is also this criticism which we should not forget that fouls's narrator is 
so much crammed with Victoriana that you almost think that he is a pedant. I think we can say definitely that Fowl's story presents us with ideas and questions that appeal both to literary critics and to historians. We can say that this is a novel that has aroused a whole lot of interest in that particular novel and a lot of interest about the form of the novel itself. Whatever I have said uh, probably will give you some idea about the endings and the story etc. But then this will be no substitute to the reading of the book. I wish you happy hours of reading. Thank you.